I would like to talk about colorectal cancer syndromes, give you an overview about the past, and you see the subtitle of the presentation is Novel Insights. If you consider the fact that 25 years back, the map on genes that can predispose to colorectal cancer has been completely empty, and the concept that colorectal cancer could in fact represent an inherited disease condition in some cases was challenged and questioned by many people in the field and for the most common form it was just not accepted and people thought it is not possible. That shows that actually the entire idea of hereditary colorectal cancer is quite a new one and quite a novel one. The year 1895 marked a very special year towards the true recognition of hereditary colorectal cancer. If you go back a little further in history to 1863, there was the first description of the classical familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, by Rudolf Virchow, a German pathologist, the famous pathologist. But it was not the description of the familial nature of this inherited disease. It was just the clinical description of one case, and it took another 60 years to identify that this is probably from the inheritance pattern an autosomal dominantly inherited disease form. So the first recognition of inherited colorectal cancer came in 1895 when Pauline Gross, there is no image available, this is her sister Tilly Gross, who was working as a seamstress for the pathologist Aldred Worthen. And Aldred Worthen was uh, working at Ann Arbor Hospital in Michigan. And he realized that his seamstress was in a dismal mood. And he followed that up and just wondered what was going on. And she told him that she's going to be die of cancer because everyone in the family died of cancer. And he took that very seriously and followed the history up and generated a detailed pedigree. And if you look at that pedigree of the family G, there are two versions that family G may refer to the name, the surname Gross. The other version is that it refers to a family that originates from Germany because this family has immigrated before the Civil War to um, the region of Michigan. This family G pedigree is very detailed, and you see a lot of cancer manifestations, these gray areas here. And if you look at that, it's pretty obvious that something is going on. And if one thinks then that the concept of hereditary colorectal cancer was not accepted and has been challenged for another about 100 years until the first proof of the genes that were mutant was brought up, it is quite surprising. There were several factors playing into this and explaining why people did not believe that it's inherited or did not want to believe that it is inherited, particularly if you tell people live healthy, then you prevent cancer, and then you add, but cancer is hereditary. It is just not the best line of arguments, and that played a role in why the truth has been held back for several years during the 1960s when Finally, Henry Lynch was coming up and showed this really perseverance and conviction. He said, saw a lot of families affected that he took care of that showed similar patterns. And finally, he revisited this family G, which has been done again in 2005. So this is the best documented pedigree of an inherited colorectal cancer and inherited cancer in general. And you can have more than 1,000 relatives you can look at. You can study the patterns of inheritance now, supplement it with molecular data, and gain very helpful insights on the phenotype of manifestation in this disease. So we now know that the family G was a Lynch syndrome family, and Lynch syndrome is now the official name of this disease. And you see that Lynch syndrome not only predisposes to colorectal cancer, and it became evident already in the beginning because Pauline Gross, ironically and tragically, did, died of endometrial cancer, even though she was the first inherited colorectal cancer case that was documented. 
So it is endometrial cancer and colorectal cancer that are the main manifestations. And among the colorectal cancer, it is clearly the colon cancers that are leading. Sometimes there are rectal cancers occurring in these patients, but rectal cancer in context of Lynch syndrome is rare. We now know that Lynch syndrome represents the most common colorectal cancer syndrome and arguably the most common cancer syndrome in general, together with BRCA for the breast cancer predisposition. And the estimations, if you look, are very high. So there may be half a million people in the EU and more than 100,000 people affected in Germany alone. Showing this, we can clearly now see, and we all agree on this, that a substantial proportion of colorectal cancer is inherited. The question then becomes, how big is this proportion? How big is the contribution of the genes? How big is the contribution of red meat of other habits? And this question cannot be fully resolved, particularly if you think of the fact that the genes have been identified only 20 years ago. It takes a lot of time until you can find out how prevalent they are and how much, how much the penetrance of a certain mutation is. Does everyone who has a mutation in DNA mismatch repair genes develop cancer, yes or no? How many is this? And there have been a lot of developments of these numbers, penetrance estimations from 80% down to 30%, back to 50%. It just takes some time because in the first years after you identify a gene, you will have the problem of an ascertainment bias. That means only people go to the clinic that are affected by the disease and everyone else running around carrying the mutations, not having a tumor is just not recognized. So you get wrong estimations and it usually takes around 20 years where we are now to get reliable or at least um, sufficiently reliable numbers. And the next question is, which genes are the predisposing genes in addition to the mismatch repair genes? Are there other ones? Are there new ones? Does it make sense to go more in detail here? And finally, the question, how does this genetic predisposition really lead to cancer? So if you look at all colorectal cancers, it is now widely accepted that the true inherited forms that are when we are talking about this, we mean the ones where we really know the gene and the mutation are about 5%. The familial form, however, there are different estimations, several studies estimating between 5 and 30%. For example, also studies led by Kari Heminki saying it is about 13%. And then there are just these factor calculations, how much can be attributed to families. And there are numbers coming up that are also lower. So probably we have the problem that we cannot say one case is just familial and the next is not anymore because we may have a lot of modifier and low penetrance genes that are just at the borderline. So that may be a continuum. Some genes are influencing positively and negatively and habits are as well. Now, focusing on the hereditary forms, which syndromes do we know and can reliably classify? So it is the Lynch syndrome we have already been talking about. This is the particular form that lacks polyposis, which was one of the reasons why it was not accepted as an inherited form. Then we have the polyposis forms, which comprise adenomatous polyposis, the classical FAP caused by APC gene mutations, the attenuated form, and rather recently described in 2002, an autosomal recessive form of the disease, which is pretty rare for inherited cancer predisposition syndromes, the MAP-YH polyposis. Then we have the more rare hamartomatous polyposis syndromes with the Pertzieger syndrome you see here, the typical tree-like branching structure of the polyp and juvenile polyposis with um, this mixed pattern of uh, genes with cis recessions in the polyps. And finally, the hyperplastic polyposis, which is now, according to the new terminology, classified as the serrated polyposis syndrome. And the genetic basis is debated, but not yet clear. If we look at the relative contribution of these various forms, we see that the Lynch syndrome is the most common form. You almost don't see the other ones unless you really zoom in and compare the prevalence in the population of Lynch syndrome and other 
colorectal cancer syndromes. And in this context, you can also try and make an estimation, though, as I said, it is very difficult about the contribution of novel genes. There has been one publication in 2013 by Ian Tomlinson's group that identified mutations following exome sequencing studies in or genome-wide sequencing studies in genes that encode for polymerase subunits epsilon and delta and other studies that have looked in colorectal cancer cohorts and um, enriched for familial risks, they see that they are pretty rare, but we cannot say at the moment how much the contribution will be, and the same holds true, of course, for novel genes that might become identified in the next years. There is a correlation between the severity of the phenotype and the prevalence of the respective predisposition mutation in patients, and you see, similarly to what Jane Figueredo has shown in her talk, there is this correlation. We have the rare and uh, high penetrance variants led by the FAP in the classical form. It is predisposing in virtually 100% to cancer if not treated. Then the polyposis, the Lynch syndrome, and low penetrance and spreading. So the question is, what can we find if we go on with genome-wide association studies and with deep sequencing studies in tumor tissue? And we can probably expect that we may find and will find other rare high penetrance genes. We will find additional low penetrance genes, most likely. And we may find modifiers that then in the different groups just influence the cancer risk in a positive or maybe also in a protective way. So how does genetic predisposition lead to cancer? We can say that one common theme of all common colorectal cancers and all common cancers that are inherited in general is that inherited cancer is caused by alterations in mechanisms that are responsible for correcting errors during DNA replication and maintaining the correct sequence. DNA repair alterations are the most common forms if you think of the BRCA double strand break repair mutations in breast cancer predisposition, the same is true as it is for colorectal cancer. Even the newly identified Paul E and Paul D genes are acting in that way. And Lynch syndrome is a case in point. How does that lead to cancer? You have in the germline one allele affected, the other allele maintains function. And that is true to cancer syndromes because people don't have an obvious phenotype with birth. They look healthy, but they develop in somatic sites later on alterations and then cancer. And this then, during cell divisions in the organism, leads to inactivation of the second allele and then hypermutable cells that may develop later on into cancer. The same is then transmitted 50% probability, autosomal dominant manner into the next generations, and the same mechanism somatically comes up again. So in Lynch syndrome, it is the mismatch repair system, and the mismatch repair system, as Magnus von Knebel has nicely illustrated yesterday, is responsible for maintaining the length of repetitive sequences. Microsatellites in the genome are prone to acquiring alterations during the replication, and that's why you need enzymes. And this is MSH2, MSH6, heterodimer recognizes alterations, and MLH1, PMS2, then recruiting the factors that correct the mistake. If the second allele of one of these genes that is predisposed in the germline is affected by a mutation, then you get inactivation of the system and consequently alterations of microsatellite length, a phenotype that we call high-level microsatellite instability. And this high-level microsatellite instability phenotype is crucial in recognizing patients that are affected by Lynch syndrome because you start the diagnostics by looking at tumor tissue, whether the system is still working or not. And if you have a proficient mismatch repair system, you can pretty much rule out the presence of Lynch syndrome in the families, with a few exceptions. This hypermutability affects secondarily microsatellites located in tumor suppressor genes that then acquire frame shifts, are not functional anymore, and the tumor can develop. We have seen yesterday that these cancers have a particular immunological phenotype. They show dense infiltration with lymphocytes, also a good prognosis 
10% better five-year survival for a Lynch syndrome-associated colon cancer compared to the sporadic colon cancer, which is likely attributable to the recognition of the frameshift peptide antigens in these cancers. And that is a nice example how the hereditary cancers can be used as kind of a model system, that we understand the molecular pathogenesis and understand how this molecular pathogenesis then translates into a certain clinical or histopathological phenotype. And the frameshift peptides are one nice example. And if you consider that the colorectal cancers are partly also sporadically MSI high, whereas the microsatellite stable resemble FAP, you can recognize that beyond recognition of patients who are suffering from hereditary diseases, these hereditary forms are very valuable model diseases to study colorectal cancer, the sporadic form in general. Of course, we want to eliminate the hereditary cancers and take away the model, but as long as we cannot do that successfully, we can draw as much information out of that for the general colorectal cancer as it is possible. One final point that I want to show to you is why do these cancers lack polyposis? And this, as I said, was one question that called into question the true hereditary nature of Lynch syndrome for several years. And you know the other name, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, HNPCC. This lack of polyposis even made it into the definition and reflects the struggles that Henry Lynch particularly had in establishing the inherited nature. So we went into the normal mucosa study together with Henrik Blecker from Pathology. You heard about that yesterday afternoon in a few slides. We went into normal mucosa and we're looking at that, what is going on there. Why do FAP patients have thousands of polyps and the Lynch syndrome patients, age 40, no cancer, nothing? What we found was that even though you see something here, some architectural changes here, it's normal mucosa, when you stain for the mismatch repair protein, then you see a lack of expression in the respective area. And if you then do that systematically for the entire colon, then you find that there are hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands of such small, tiny lesions that are the morphological correlate to polyps in Lynch syndrome. So you see that pretty clearly here, and here is an example for an EPCAM deletion carrier, a newly identified gene causative of Lynch syndrome, where you can find the transition zone between still expressing and lacking, and sometimes it's just one crypt. And these crypts show the molecular phenotype actually of what we know as MSI cancer. They have the shifts, they lack the expression, but they are not cancer. And that shows us that the inactivation of a second allele is not sufficient to induce a cancer in hereditary cancer syndromes. It requires more. And from our estimations now, we would say that it requires 20,000 events to finally cause one cancer. That shows again that there are substantial and effective defense mechanisms of the host that are related to senescence induction, apoptosis induction, and most likely immune rejection. And Lynch syndrome is the perfect model for studying that and also for testing colorectal cancer preventive vaccines as outlined by Magnus von Knebel, where you really can show the concept of a preventive vaccine can work. So we say now that the mismatch repair deficiency alone is not sufficient. It may occur as the leading event followed by inactivation of other crucial genes, but most combinations are most likely not viable and lead to elimination. Or it may occur in pre-existing adenomas because the adenoma prevalence in Lynch syndrome mutation carriers is pretty similar to the general population. Maybe a little bit higher, but not significant. So we have found in last years, and research has progressed in this field, identified novel genes that are relevant for known syndromes. That means you have a known syndrome and identify more genes. You have new sequence technologies. You have new analysis for larger deletions, like the MLPA technology that allows to detect about 5 to 10 percent more mutations in families affected. Then new genes were identified. The YH, Paul E, Paul D, and the 
understanding of the pathomechanisms has really deepened during last years. And that's my final slide, the perspectives. Where are we going and what are our primary goals that we should follow up? One thing is identify new genes. Definitely find more families, more genes, more syndromes to provide better care in the families that have a phenotype but that we cannot explain so far. And this allows to apply a more tailored and individual screening to these patients. At that point, one has to mention that it is also of crucial importance if one thinks that maybe only about 10% of Lynch syndrome families, and that's optimistic, have been identified in the EU to spread the already existing news. It is very important to inform the physicians involved and the patients involved that one just has to be aware of the existence of the syndromes to really identify the families and prevent the cancers, particularly if you see advanced cancers in uh, relatives and find out that could have been prevented. And we have to work on still finding clues on the molecular pathogenesis, develop better diagnostic tools derived from that. If you have better markers that are relevant for progression and transformation, that could also lead to adaptive screening, less less invasive, less side effect uh, laden, and the ultimate goal would be like the aspirin study or the vaccine study that we want to develop primary prevention strategies. It's always much better if you can give something to the patient that the polyp does not develop, the cancer does not develop, but just detecting it early and then taking it out. So we hope that in the next years these very promising results may help to identify more patients and provide better care to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Are there questions? I may start with one. It's always puzzling to me why in mismatch repair deficient patients or persons predominantly colorectal cancer develops. Is there anything known why the colorectal epithelium is so, let's say, vulnerable for this kind of deficiencies? and not lung epithelium or whatever? Yeah. That's a very interesting question that cannot definitely be answered, but there are speculations, there is evidence. One of the most convincing concepts is that the target genes that are defined by the presence of repetitive sequences in the coding region, like the TGF beta receptor 2, play a role particularly in these organ systems. That means some tumor suppressor genes that are relevant in a certain organ become particularly vulnerable as targets. And um, this is supported by the fact that TGF beta receptor signaling that is involved in smart signaling particularly plays a role in the proximal colon. And that's exactly what we see colon cancers occur in the proximal colon in the context of Lynch syndrome. There are other epigenetic, epigenetic factors that may play a role and that are discussed. And host and uh, microbiome interactions may play a role as well, but the proof for that is not as far as it is for this relation. Okay. Are there further questions?